Good evening, everybody. Thank you for braving the rain. Um, welcome to the Cambridge Festival here at the Cambridge Union. Um, I won't talk too much longer and I'll hand straight over to our panel. So please give a round of applause to our speakers. They just took our pictures and we had to sit in the middle as girls for protection, didn't we? So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, this is undoubtedly the most important event at this festival. And that's not misinformation or disinformation. Um, because we are going to talk tonight about misinformation, statistics and lies but we're going to add in disinformation and conspiracy theories. And I can't, the reason I say it's so important is that if you look at what is happening today in terms of the lies that we are reading and seeing uh, regarding the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, uh, and also uh, the frightening prospects of lies in our upcoming election and in the US elections because we saw what happened last time round. But even, we may even touch on the absolutely disgusting conspiracy theories about Princess Catherine. Uh, but luckily we have here a top panel to deal with it all. So first of all, on my right is David Spiegelholter and he is Emeritus Professor of Statistics in the Centre for Mathematical Sciences at the University of Cambridge. Um, but also, I like him. I do actually like him. Um, <laughs> because one of the things that you say um, is that I, his two favourite things, one is being on Desert Island is boring, but the other is that in 2011, he came seventh in an episode of BBC One's Winter Wipeout. And I, can I say, it's on YouTube. I've watched it, and I think it's one of your best performances. It is, it's, you're <laughs> terrific. Highlight. And then we've got Mariana Spring here, um, the BBC's first disinformation and social media correspondent, and also the author of a great book, Among the Trolls. And I worked out a statistic about Mariana just to impress. David, actually I didn't, I got someone else to do it for me. <laughs> but between January and June last year, of all the attacks on social media against people who work for the BBC, 81.2465% of them were attacking you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a real accolade. Uh, uh, you know, it's nearly as good as Winter Wipeout. <laughs> and Kamal Ahmed, now Kamal has been head of so many things at the BBC that I'm not going to bother reading them all out. Um, and he is now the um, uh, editor-in-chief and co-founder of the News Movement. Uh, and he's going to tell us in a minute what that's all about. And finally, I forgot myself because I'm a woman, that's what we do. Um, and I'm Dorothy Byrne, I'm the president of Murray Edwards College here. And I used to be um, the head of news and current affairs at Channel 4, which I think is why they invited me to be here, because um, we make such better programmes than the BBC, what can I say? Um, so how this is going to work is that I'm going to ask each of them for five minutes to tell us what they think are for them the most important subjects. Yeah, time is off. Mustn't run over. But if you do, it's all right. I'll just tell you to keep quiet. And then we'll have a chat for about another 15 minutes. So there's a good half hour for everybody to have their say, ask questions. So I'm going to ask Mariana to kick off. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much for coming. 
Um, so, like Dorothy explained, I'm the BBC's first ever disinformation and social media correspondent, um, which means I spend far too much of my time investigating basically everything bad uh, that's happening online and its real-world consequences. Um, for me, I think um, the most important thing, perhaps the most concerning thing, is the real-world impact that what's unfolding on our social media feeds is having, and whether it's elections, um, democracy, whether it's uh, wars, um, other violence, terror attacks, um, uh, or just individuals being targeted in a really cruel way. This can cause very serious harm and it can affect everything that's unfolding in our day-to-day -day lives. We kind of can't untangle social media from um, the real world. And the worst bits are disinformation, conspiracy theories, um, hate that's often used as a weapon to reinforce that disinformation. Um, and so I kind of increasingly think, particularly in this massive election year, where there's also all kinds of things happening all around, all around the world, and here in the UK too, um, that we have to be more aware than ever of the role that our social media feeds play in shaping what we see, feeding us content that confirms our biases so that we're more vulnerable to disinformation, perhaps in a way that we maybe weren't before um, and I think it's really important and what I try to do in my job is to actually meet the people who are being harmed by what's happening um, and to also meet the people who are doing it to ask them questions to understand to come face to face with them and crucially to hold the social media companies to account who are often very responsible for this but who are very unaccountable over the past 12 months I haven't been able to interview a single exec or boss who works at a social media company and if that was a cabinet minister or a politician we'd say oh hang on um, yeah, so for me, I think it's all about applying the same investigative principles we have uh, for a very long time to other areas, to this world of social media, because I think fact-checking on its own and just saying that's not true is actually not enough anymore. Thank you. Kamal, over to you, and do explain what the, about what the news movement is, but yeah. without it sounding like an advert. Fine. Um, so thanks so much, Dorothy. It's lovely to see you, but thanks so much as well for the invitation and seeing so many people here um, tonight. So I've had a lengthy career in traditional media. Uh, as you suggest, uh, Dorothy, I've been, I was at the BBC for eight years, economics editor, business editor, and then editorial director. I've also worked for The Guardian, The Observer, and The Telegraph. And... Um, Many of us in senior positions in traditional media have seen a growing problem in the way that we tell stories, and the problem is our audiences. And one data point that is really important, and it's the Reuters Institute, which operates out of Oxford University, which every year does the digital news report. And they found that the fastest growing audience cohort uh, for news consumption, particularly amongst young people, was news avoidance. And as you say, Mariana, the social media revolution, traditional media was too slow to move when the means of creation and the means of distribution of information fundamentally were changed by social media, which obviously built on the digital revolution and the internet. And that allowed, for an awful long time, clear blue water for other people to create information and new information ecology. So part of this problem is on our watch and is a problem of the traditional media. And the news movement has been one attempt amongst many others and lots of work being done by the BBC and others. And the news movement... Myself and my co-founder, Will Lewis, William Lewis, who is now actually the chief executive of the Washington Post in America, but um, for three years we worked together at Building. What should the news look like to be able to have a fair crack at engaging big audiences, as misinformation often does, in social media spaces? What does news and useful information look like in this new ecology? Because... If I'm thinking about my daughter who is 23 or my son who is 20, they don't navigate the news or information in the same way I did. It was literally possible to miss the news when I was my son's age. If you didn't watch BBC One at 9 o'clock at night, you missed the news until the news gods decided when to give you the news again at 1 o'clock the following day. There wasn't even breakfast news in uh, television when I was a young um, 
boy growing up in West London. So part of this problem has been the lack of skilled information, good information, accurate, fact-based, but engaging information in social media spaces. And the news movement is trying to be one of many, some within traditional media organisations, the work that Mariana does, but also the work that BBC News does more generally, but also a flotilla of new news organisations that are trying to rethink how can we fight misinformation with better information. And we've been on this journey for three years. We're partnered with the Associated Press, 177-year-old um, um, news, classically trusted news wire service based in New York and London. We produce social media content on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Snap, and on our own digital site. So we go to where our audience is and we tell news in different ways. And then just the challenge, uh, Dorothy, that we've been asked about, misinformation, statistics, and lies. I think just three quick points. Firstly, we need to be very careful about our definitions. Um, disinformation, government industrialized attacks on particularly democratic societies to create mistrust in civic good is one thing which needs to be tackled in an array of different ways by the, gov by the democratic elected governments themselves, by regulators, um, via more traditional methods. Then there's misinformation, and then there's what you might describe as benign information that is a little bit wrong and lacks rigour. And the news movement's approach, um, as I say, alongside others, is all about partnership, not either or. It's not a binary debate we're involved in here. There's clear blue water for many of us to operate in. The news movement's uh, mission is to fight misinformation and benignly wrong information, people who don't use the rigour of journalism to check what it is they're doing, um, with good information that uses the skills of the new storytelling techniques that are available via social media. So first of all, definition of terms, definition of audience. How do we think about different audiences in this space? Because... This group here, wonderful as you all are, are not maybe representative of the whole population. As I said at the beginning, there are many people who avoid the news, who aren't engaged with what Mariana does, however brilliantly uh, she does it. So we have to think about different mechanisms and different spaces to have these arguments and uh, debates. So that's the audience issue. And then, for our industry, we have to tell stories differently. The modern model of storytelling, which is the clever sort of professor of news, tells willing passive audience the facts, is not a social media way of telling and revealing information. And so we have to move from, for some audiences, not for all audiences, it's still vital we have those methods, that's the way I consume information, but for my daughter and my son, and what we Generation Z, 18 to 24, and Gen Alpha, who are coming up um, behind them, 10 to 18-year-olds, they consume news and information in a way that we describe as horizontal storytelling. Friends finding out together, create intrigue, take me on a journey. But then, just to make sure that there's not just a, um, uh, a manifesto of bleakness, we believe two things about all people we all, in the end, lean to good, or the majority of us lean to good, and we want to be smart and we don't want to be had. And if we can position useful and good information in that space, keep your head screwed on, don't be had by bad actors, don't be hash PR, don't be hash ad. If we can do that and show that we can be on that journey, we believe in our specific space, good information can win. Thank you. David, you can go on a bit if you want. No, <laughs> I, I, I want to be... Um, right, off we go. Um, yes, I, I mean, I'm not like these people here. I'm not one of these media johnnies. I mean, I'm a, I'm a real statistician. So, but I'm, and I, you know, I'm so used to the lies, damn lies and statistics. It's, it's nice to have a slight variation on it, I suppose. 
But um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about lies, because on the whole, when people misuse statistics in the news or social media, they're not usually lies. Usually the number has got some sort of source. It is a number you can find somewhere. It's just that very often it's just been picked out as a deliberate number to give a certain impression, and, and then it's interpreted wrongly. So what I deal with all the time is not lies. Um, it's, it's misinterpretation and misuse. And you know, I think, but I think it's incredibly important. We saw that during COVID, which is a huge statistical exercise. The amount of misuse of data by people still doing, making um, you know, uh, inappropriate claims. I've got to be quite nice. I must not be too, too um, slanderous about people. Inappropriate claims on social media are quite, you know, it happened then and it's still happening. So what, I, what I'm interested in, what you can do about it, particularly as sort of professionals, either as communicators or as statisticians or as academics or whatever. And um, in this, I'm hugely influenced by Professor Baroness Honora O'Neill, a Kantian philosopher from Cambridge, and who, who made this brilliant observation that, you know, we as experts, we want to be trusted. You know, of course we want to be trusted. Everyone, we, of course, you know, and we, in our little group in the university, get people coming to us. So how can we get people to trust us? And what Honora identified is that's the wrong thing. You are asking the wrong question. Kant, duty, ethics, and all that sort of stuff. What you should be saying is, how can we demonstrate trustworthiness? So it's back on the communicator to be trustworthy. And that's why I so admire the idea of the news movement. Actually, you're just trying to do it properly. You're trying to be, but you're trying to be engaging. Because the other thing, I, my little quote I use is that there's no point of being trustworthy if you're dull. Because <laughs> no one's going to take any notice of you. So, so I, I, I've just become, with people I work with, really concerned with this idea of trustworthy communication, both being able to do it and being able to check whether it's being done and educating the public and kids and school, whatever, to be able to take apart a story and identify where, whether it's trustworthy. And one of the crucial things that's been found in the research on this is, is just as you said, that people love to be empowered. They love to be able to spot when they're being taken. So my colleague, Sander van der Linders, works on the idea of inoculating against fake news. And it's a big academic area of research now in which you prime people. You tell them the fake news before they hear it from somebody else. You tell them, do you know there's people going around saying that COVID vaccines are killing more people than they're saving, blah, 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 and this is why it's wrong. And you prime them. You inoculate them. And then when they hear it, they say, oh, I know about that. I've heard that. I'm not going to be taking it by that. So you turn it into almost a game of, of, of helping people to do that. And uh, that's found to be effective. So there's other aspects of trustworthiness that one should be being, trying, to be trying to be balanced, not trying to persuade people, not trying to manipulate their emotions to reassure them or to frighten them. We saw so much of that during COVID. And, and actually telling both sides of the story, you know, good journalism, the, the winners and the losers, the, the, um, the benefits and the harms. Um, for example, you know, I think that this phrase, vaccines are safe and effective, is misinformation. It should never be used. Vaccines are safe and effective enough to be used on certain people at certain times. And to just to say vaccines, you know, the COVID vaccine or any vaccine is safe and effective, I believe is misinformation because it's not trustworthy. And we've done lots of research on if you do try to do things in a trustworthy way, admitting uncertainty, acknowledging that the evidence isn't very good, um, preempting misunderstandings, that um, audiences... So what happens when you do the research, you do, we do randomized trials showing the message in two different ways about vaccines, about nuclear power. And when you do that, you find that the people who were not skeptical, you know, who agreed with vaccines and nuclear power, it made no difference at all. But the people who were skeptical, who distrusted vaccines, who distrusted nuclear power, trusted the balanced message, the trustworthy message, more than the usual one-sided propaganda that we can get from governments. And so that means that when, you know, communications offices put out these one-sided messages, vaccines are safe and effective, blah, 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 you should do this, you should do this, they're actively decreasing trust in the very group they're trying to meet, trying to get to, and which is, you know, just counterproductive. So I get quite influenced enormously by Honora O'Neill that there, there is a duty, a duty ethics to actually do this stuff properly and then 
you know, and it's also, of course, of practical benefit at all. And I haven't got time now because I've reached my five well, minutes. You can go on. Oh no, because <laughs> I could ramble about education, about the fact that, yeah. that how this needs to be brought into schools, the ability to critique data, data literacy. And I'm on a group that's you know proposing that to change the whole of maths education into mathematical and data education in schools. This is the plan over the next 20 years to change it so that everybody is can do. You know, I don't call it maths. It's numeracy, it's using data, it's using numbers. We have to do it. You can't just say, oh, I don't like maths. Sorry, <laughs> you've got to do it. <laughs> Everyone has to do it, has to be able to do it. And in particular, to be able to critique a number when they hear it and not just go like and send it off. And I could talk about regulation of, on algorithms and we can come on to that later. But that's it. Yeah. For a moment, I'd like us to just think about who is lying to us and why they're lying to us. And um, Mariana, you've looked at individuals. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about them and then perhaps, Kamal, you could talk a bit about these, these, the, the role of governments and with each group, presumably, how we have to combat them is going to be different. So uh, tell us about the people who troll you and because you have discovered they're lying and they don't like it. Um, totally. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very trolled, like you say, um, mainly because um, I've become a bit of a lightning rod for um, the kinds of people who are members of these very committed conspiracy theory movements. And I think it's really useful, like you say, to break down the different types of people who are spreading disinformation or misinformation. Um, and like Kamal says, you know, governments and um, powerful groups of people do that all the time, have for centuries. Social media has in some ways turbocharged that. When it comes to the smaller people, perhaps, who do this kind of thing, I like to separate it into two different categories. You've got the true believers, and then you've got the non-believers with a kind of question mark at the end. And the non-believers are the people who, in the conspiracy land hierarchy, are the people who are pushing uh, conspiracy theories, disinformation, because it's beneficial to them in some way. Maybe they're able to grow a following, a committed following, who will give them money. Maybe they're able to um, have a fan base, you know, people who say, you're so great, I'm so interested in what you have to say, and make them feel important and powerful and give them a certain agency um, that they otherwise felt they didn't have. Um, and those people I've spent quite a lot of time tracking down, coming face to face with, asking difficult questions of, but also trying to understand. Um, and I'm a big believer believer in um, the approach of being both investigative and empathetic to some degree. And I think that you absolutely want to hold people to account, particularly when they're profiting from spreading disinformation um, and causing harm to people. But it's also kind of useless if you can't figure out why they're doing it and what's driving it. Um, and some of the most memorable non-believers question mark that I've met and because it's kind of hard to ever prove whether they do or don't believe this stuff I think a lot of the time they actually convince themselves of these kinds of mistruths because it's become useful or beneficial to them in some way and um, there are two in particular one who I came face to face with uh, who was a conspiracy theory newspaper editor um, who agreed to do an interview with me um, but only if I uh, he could also ask me questions which I agreed to I said you're welcome to ask me questions and so we had this four hour back and forth um, and every time he was like after you've asked one question I ask one question and if we at all change the format he was not happy um, and um, it was really it was really revealing not so much in the answers he gave because it kind of felt a little bit like a conspiracy theory bingo and when I talk about conspiracy theories here and I think it's really important that the point you made about you know how you know what is misinformation what is disinformation what are conspiracy theories I deal in the really extreme stuff like COVID is a hoax it never happened terror attacks never really happened um, um, uh, this newspaper, while it contained mundane articles, um, also had uh, content that was, you know, saying that climate change was just completely made up and invented and it's not happening um, and all kinds of other really extreme conspiracy theories. Um, and so we were talking back and forth um, and there was this moment in the interview where I sort of just had to say to this guy, I was kind of like, look, you, you really want to believe this stuff. Um, nothing I say is going to change that and that's kind of not really my job my job is to actually understand why you're doing this and to hold you to account for it because there was also a lot of hateful rhetoric that was accompanying this um but the conversation was so difficult because it felt like we were talking about totally different things like we can all look at this table and you know 
you guys might love the table, we might hate the table, but we fundamentally agree that the table is there. If the person you're interviewing doesn't think the table is there, it's really, really hard to talk to them. And actually, it kind of becomes pointless to talk about the table because they don't think the table's there. Um, and so a lot of the interviews with the non-believers are like that. There's another who um, spread really extreme conspiracy theories targeting survivors of terror attacks, including the Manchester Arena bombing, um, and uh, admitted to secretly filming, uh, for example, one young woman who was left severely disabled after that attack uh, in order to check whether she was faking her injuries. Like, really extreme stuff where you think, how have you reached the point where you think that that's a kind of normal thing to believe and a normal way to behave? Like, the tactics were very shocking. And when I met him and questioned him, I, it was a doorstep where you turn up and you ask questions. And he was really scared. I mean, that was my impression, was he didn't want to answer the questions. It was the first time someone had confronted him about this. And since then, both of these people, the newspaper editor and um, this uh, disaster troll, as we sort of called him, um, have doubled down. They've continued to spread these conspiracy theories to their followers because it's, it's of benefit to them, because they profit from it. Um, I think they're different from the true believers. The true believers, for me, are the people who are their devoted followers, the people who often have been, like you say, sort of misled by them and fallen for this stuff and are actually, in some ways, I think, victims in this too, even though they're also causing harm. Um, and those people... I think it's really, really important that our approach is very much trying to understand how they've reached that point and untangling legitimate concerns, questions, distrust, the impact social media is having on them and what they're being fed from then the extreme conspiratorial content. And a lot of these people are seeking community. I think we have a lot of misconceptions about the true believers. I often think the true believers are, um, are not, you know, stupid or mad or other things that people kind of say that they could be. They're actually very curious. They're often clever, but cynical, very, very cynical, um, uh, very distrustful, often very anxious. They're looking for community. They're lacking agency. And all of those things are the kind of perfect cocktail in the right circumstances to lead them into this very kind of isolating community, almost cult-like community, where you're separated from everyone else. Um, so I think we have to understand them better. And then the third group I say are kind of I, I think the kind of majority of people who sometimes, like, I think what's been unfolding with the Princess of Wales is a really good example of this. Um, and we've seen lots of social media frenzies like this. You know, people like to gossip and they like speculation and they're interested and they want to know what's going on. And I think all of us can be vulnerable to that, particularly when we're then seeing more content that kind of says, actually, maybe it's okay to share this kind of stuff. Oh, maybe I can post a video like this and I'll get lots of likes and views or my friends are doing it and I'm being validated online. And I think we have to address that too, which is the kind of the way that we can all be vulnerable to this stuff. Um, and we have to empower, I hope, in my reporting, I try and do this, like take people with me to investigate what's going on and, and say, like, you know, exactly like you say, we're not the kind of news gods. It's like, come with me. And whether it's a podcast or a panorama documentary or whatever it is, to really show people, or an online article, show people our workings and help them understand so that we're all kind of better protected when those kinds of social media frenzies are happening to think, hang on a second, this could actually be really harmful. And, you know, it's good to ask questions, really good to ask questions, but there's a point where it's maybe not so nice. I'd just like to ask you something first, David, about the extent to, because you mentioned how we need to educate children in schools, to what extent do you think it's a problem that nearly all journalists and nearly all politicians um, don't understand <coughs> statistics, have degrees in subjects like philosophy or politics and because we saw some of that in COVID but in general do you think that journalists and politicians themselves understand enough about statistics when or are they just deliberately misinterpreting things? Yeah I, I don't think their first degree makes it is is the most important thing. Some of the best people I know at taking apart statistical stories have done the English literature at university extremely good at critiquing narratives because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about storytelling, a persuasive argument with numbers. But the main thing is they're not frightened of the numbers. And, and you know, actually prepared to look at them and say, is this a big number? As Tim Harford would always say, the first question is, is this a big number? So you're not frightened. You don't back away from it. So I don't think one needs... Um, I think you need... Basically, it would be great if more journalists and more politicians had two... Had, had, you know, Basically, two things, not to be frightened of numbers and to have some idea of the scientific method. The anecdote and story is fine to give an impression, 
it doesn't actually tell you what's going on in the world. You know, it doesn't tell you what is the case in, in, in terms of, um, you know, the effectiveness of vaccines, anything like that. You just can't, oh, this is what happened to me. This is not, this is more than just anecdote. You require the scientific method to actually show something rather than just claiming, oh, I sourced this data, I, I had this, this, you know, this people had this diet and they lived till they were something or other. No, that, that doesn't work at all. So that's what would also be really good if people understood. But I don't think it's necessary that everyone has to have done maths or science. You know, it would be great if some more did. But the, the bar is much lower than that. It's about basic numeracy and not being frightened of, of numbers and science. I think you're right, Dorothy. I think there is a... I think that we have, in our industry, we have moved into that data space yeah. in a way because we've, we've realised, I hope we've realised, that we need all the levers we can gain to say to our audiences, we're worth listening to. And I think data has become part of we're worth listening to rather than I'm just giving an opinion or a point of view. And I think it comes back to this point which has completely fundamentally changed relationships between information providers and audiences, which is that the means of creation of content mm. and its distribution has completely and utterly changed and has become, to an extent, democratised. And you, you, you asked me a little earlier, Dorothy, who does this, uh, about the disinformation side of it, and as Mariana, you say, this is a, some areas where you are working as well on, on the really harsh end of this and of course a lot of that is not people it's governments and institutions and we I'm sure we'll get on to this and David you mentioned about regulation is that these are bot farms that are creating um, uh, I'm sure many of the people trolling you Mariana aren't people they are um, uh, pushers created by algorithmic um, coding to attack certain points of view and to constantly destabilize civic society because the end point is not whether you believe or disbelieve X or Y, it's that you just lose trust. And if you lose trust in civic institutions, you lose trust in democracy and therefore authoritarian regimes start winning in the narrative war. Add to that large language model artificial intelligence and you're starting to get a very particular type of threat to the way we operate and the information ecology we operate in where we need to be very very thoughtful about how we manage ourselves through this next five to ten years because in ten years time AI is already in the water you can't single out AI and say, right, we'll have non-AI and AI. It's, it's in the water of everything we do already. And how we have this journey whilst maintaining the notions of accurate, fair, engaging um, uh, information. I love the point you made, David, about we have to prove trustworthiness rather than demanding that people trust us. And for too long, our side of the fence, added to the issue you've added, Dorothy, which is, you just don't know numbers, but on, for too long on our side of the fence, the uh, creators of news information, we have been too pompous about who is this for? Is it for my peer group who are all a certain type of person or is it actually for the audience? And just one small example for the news movement, when we started, it was just before the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. And I asked my team, the average age of our newsroom is 25 um, in New York and London. So I work with young people all day, every day, who are obviously digital natives and literate in these spaces. And I asked them to watch television news the night before and to say, how did that make you feel? Um, and what did you take from it? And so they usually watched uh, a TV news bulletin the night before and they came in in the morning. They didn't watch the news on telly, which of course is true for many, many uh, young people. They get their news via their mobile phones in vertical video. And I just asked them, what were the two emotions that, that came out or what were the main emotions that came out after you'd watched um, uh, the television news? And the two emotions were, uh, they felt scared and they felt stupid because clearly something very bad was happening and secondly, they didn't really understand what it was. 
because actually two weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the main question being asked by our age group, which of course you can go and search on social media to look for the questions that are being asked, was not the detail that they would be given by a lot of traditional journalism, but was, where is Ukraine? Lots of the audience had never heard of it, they didn't know where it was, and so if we start the journey, as we so often do, series five, episode six, but our audiences haven't watched the first five series and can't remember them even if they have, we're starting our storytelling in the wrong place. So the news movement's part of this journey is to fight misinformation with better information that's more connected. So our first piece on TikTok that got a million views literally started with the search today, the biggest search today across um, uh, social media is where is Ukraine? And we literally pointed to it on a map. And it got a million views because people thought, right, that's telling me what I understand. And if we keep people fearful and feeling stupid, they will search for people that tell them things that are simple and don't make them feel stupid because it's easier set of emotions to deal with. Now, while I would agree with you that television news is often um, leaves you afraid and feeling ignorant and doesn't explain things properly, I think it is important to point out that television news is the most trusted form of news in this yes. country. Um, it's level, the level of trust in television news is more than 70%. It is going down a bit, but only a bit, which is way more than trust in other forms of news. Television news is still massively used. I think something like um, 69 percent of people use BBC News, something like that each <laughs> month, <laughs> once a month. <laughs> once a month. I don't. Yeah, no, it is. It's really <laughs> high. Yeah, but you see, that's because. Can I tell you that what we're told all the time is nobody watches mainstream media anymore. Well, there's a reason it's called mainstream, is that people are watching it. They watch it. And they trust it. And, of course, a key reason they trust it is because it is regulated, um, except GB News seems to be allowed to get away with anything they want. Um, so I think it is important in a, a, a panel on misinformation that we shouldn't give the impression that nobody's watching it anymore. There are high percentages of young people watching it in emergencies, in COVID, in a terrorist attack, you get incredibly high percentages of people watching it. So I just wanted yeah. to... I, sorry, to be really clear, right. I completely agree with you. This is not a binary question. Yeah. It is that some audiences don't watch television news, and many, many do. And the audiences that watch television news... I worked in television news for many years. I love television news. It is vital that we support it and keep it, and it is brilliant. Sorry, I yeah. wasn't suggesting for a moment... No, I, I, that it's just, it's I think, a panel like yeah. this can give I people the you. impression... Yeah. So all that means that BBC News doesn't matter anymore, so you can privatise the BBC. And, and so yes. I, That's I, quite a leap, but yes. <laughs> no, but, I agree uh, with but you. But yeah. people make that leap. But to, to your point as well, I think actually it's both of your yeah. points, which is that like, consuming like, what we call linear, like straightforward TV bulletins, like the audience is, a, is, is different and it definitely skews older. Um, but actually the, the kinds of journalism that we do, and I think my job is sort of the new model perhaps of how a TV correspondent or a, a BBC uh, reporter works, which is that I do podcasts. All of my reporting is across, like, not just the news at 10, but on social media and online. And it's those places where they're, you know, they prove really popular with young audiences, not just because, like you say, Kamal, they're in the right places that those audiences are and therefore they want to consume it, but also because it's done in the right way, which is humanising it and bringing it to life and telling them, like, why it matters. I think there's a lot of kind of just saying, like, this is true, this isn't true, and that's not always that helpful. It's actually like, this isn't true, and here's actually the harm it can cause or the, 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 the impact it could have on your life or how it could be affecting you. And we find that there's such high engagement in that kind of reporting because... Um, audiences want to kind of come with you as you tell them the story. Um, and a lot of that is about, like, the changing ways, I guess, that we tell the news and, and where we tell it as well. Um, but actually, the fundamental... I always think, like, the hopeful thing, because I often talk to, you know, young journalists who are wanting... thinking, oh, what's... 
don't know, what's the media going to look like in 20 years' time? I think that fundamentally, like journalists, and particularly investigative reporters, but just journalists who can communicate and explain things, will always be important. It's just where they're doing it and how they're doing it. Yeah, so you've got the, the central news machine, which is creating regulated news, which is not for everybody everywhere, um, but which is then available to you in, in all different forms. And, and in fact, now... Um, BBC News is regulated online as well in ways that it wasn't. Um, I just had to just speak up for television it's and mainstream news. It's so before we come to the audience, I'd like to ask each of you what you think the key issues for us as individuals and as a nation and what we should be saying to our governments um, in the run-up to our general election because we are fundamentally now in an election period so we need useful information and advice from you you know, as the election comes along what should we be doing and thinking and telling others to look out for Mariana That's a very good question that's consuming a lot of my time at the moment. Um, I think that the two most important things from my point of view are, so I spend a lot of time running um, undercover accounts, which sounds dodgy but isn't, uh, which basically involves um, setting up accounts that allow me to investigate the way that different people could be recommended different kinds of content by algorithms and basically to, to figure out what, what the algorithms are up to because the social media companies are not transparent about that. And so with this election on the horizon in, in the UK and the US and everywhere, but particularly in the UK, I'm setting up more of these undercover voters um, to be able to see what different people are being recommended and targeted with. And so my first bit of advice I think would be be to all of us really to be just really aware of the way that we are fed content that confirms our biases, how we can interrogate that content and say hang on a second what's going on here is this an ad is it sponsored who's it coming from who's sharing it is there something suspicious does it look like an authentic account is it a real person or is it not and um, all of that kinds of stuff I think if, if we can all be hyper aware of it then it's a really good thing I think very specifically one thing that I could see having a big impact is um, AI content but especially AI generated audio because um, some of the most uh, effective examples of AI generated content I've investigated so far have, invo have involved faked audio that seems like it's a secret recording or it's a politician being caught off guard saying something they shouldn't. Often AI video is not that convincing because why would a politician sit in front of a camera and say something that like, otherwise they wouldn't say. But secret recordings are really easy to believe because politicians get caught saying stuff they shouldn't say all the time. So I think that's something that we really have to look out for, although I don't think that we should be distracted by AI in so much as really simple content, memes, videos, amateur sleuths, I'm picking stuff, as we've just seen with the conspiracy theories around the Princess of Wales, they can be just as effective with no AI at all. Um, so, yeah, I think those would be my main things to look out for. And the companies which tell us how they are responsible and um, can we trust them at all to look out for our interests? Um, I would say that the social media companies have varying levels of engagement. Oh, um, works for the BBC. Yes. <laughs> One of the interesting things at the moment is X, for example, which um, we used to call Twitter. If you send X a right of reply, so like a series of allegations you're putting to them, you still get just an automated email that says, busy, be back later, and they just never reply. I mean, that level of accountability is like, whoa. You're kind of like, hang on. It's, I can't, you know, you can, you can put endless allegations to them and they, you just don't even get a response anymore. The other social media companies do send you a response. I don't know which one's better in some ways because they'll often send you a response that is actually just the opposite of what you, you're saying. Well, I've just exposed that this has happened. You're recommending this kind of content or you're allowing this kind of content. It's caused serious harm. And then they kind of come back to you and say, oh, just to let you know, we don't allow this kind of content and we don't yes. recommend yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's what I've just shown you. So I think that um, one, of, one of the things I really care about is sort of ac accountability for the social media companies. And I do think we should treat them like governments. I think a lot of them are as powerful, if not more powerful than governments, but the level of transparency we ask of them is so much lower. Um, and I always kind of have to caveat this by saying, I'm a reporter, I'm not a campaigner, it's not my job to sort of come up with the solution. But I can see something that, you know, in 10 years' time, we'll look back and go, whoa. 
How did that happen? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, I think that just to build on that, what should we be asking is that the platforms need to come to the table and they need to be held accountable for the distribution mechanisms that they use, which empowers a lot of the things that Mariana is fighting every day. And I think that's the most important thing. We as um, individual, you know, people who run media businesses or work in, you know, important and vital uh, media businesses can only go so far without an understanding of how the algorithms work and we have seen just um, in the last uh, few days and weeks, and a lot of media organizations have pushed against it, Meta, who run Instagram, have deprioritized political information on Instagram. And you now have to change your permissions and your, um, uh, your preferences to get political information. And you're absolutely right, Mariana, in a democratic society, the lack of democratic accountability at platform level is really vital. It doesn't mean they're all bad. It just means we're leaving it to them to decide what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, we're in discussions with TikTok, with Alphabet, obviously own Google and uh, YouTube, as well as have, you know, a large language model um, and generative AI in uh, DeepMind. We're talking to Meta. But... These organizations can um, amplify trusted information or de-amplify it. it is, and, and it is up to them how they operate in that space. And you'll remember, Dorothy, when Facebook, as it then was before it changed its name, deprioritized what were called news feeds. And maybe some mm. people in maybe the millennial generation will remember news feeds on Facebook. It almost closed down the independent because it completely changed the business model for those uh, media organizations who were using the income from the advertising from social media platforms to, to pay for sustainable journalism. Now, we're not all fortunate enough to have the support that the BBC and public service broadcasters have. Um, and unless we only want a public service broadcasting ecology, which I say would be a huge shame for the ecology of journalism mm -hmm. in the UK, and elsewhere, the platforms need to be held to account for how they distribute verified, trust, well, trustworthy, at least people that work for trust um, organisations. I think that's the most important policy discussion in our industry over the next five to ten years. Thank you. And David, from your perspective, election looming, what yeah, are your yeah. thoughts? I think, I mean, we're going to see a lot, I mean, you always see lots of unsubstantiated claims in elections and is going to be even more now. And I think the, the crucial is, thing is something that I think goes back, you know, is always held that we need to encourage people and ourselves to be sceptical but not cynical. So it means actually questioning what you're seeing without rejecting everything and saying, oh, you can't just trust anybody, which is, a, which is completely the wrong, um, wrong perspective. So I, I, and of course, really just to back up that, I think, I think we're going to look back in the future and think, what was going on at this time? This Wild West when these... How did we allow these companies to do... to act in such a way that was so manipulative, manipulative and so dangerous and that their algorithms are private, they're not responding? So I would, you know, I think... I would hope that the future will be in regulation of the recommendation algorithms. Yeah. And that, that is the crucial... You don't, have, you don't have to censor anybody. There's no, everyone should have a right to put what they want up. They don't have a right to have it distributed at, at will. So I think that's crucial. Can I say a word for AI? Um, we heard a lot about AI. Oh, AI is doing this, AI is doing AI can be really good at, in this area, very useful in this area. I mean, I'm sure the, the companies are probably already using AI to spot in certain sort of forms of content. But i just say an exercise I did today. There was an absolutely awful story I mean, it's in, in, the, in the scale of things, it's pretty mild about, um, you know, um, you know uh, time-restricted time eating, um, eating only in an eight-hour window per day, um, raising the risk of cardiovascular death by 91%. So I was on the front page of the Times last week. I fought to get that story, to stop the coverage of that paper, that story, because it was based on a, you know, a, a conference abstract that was press released making this bold claim. And um, I said, oh, this, is, this is awful, you shouldn't do this, it's a disgrace. This, this um, uh, abstract was, was, was press released, 
blah, blah, blah. It still got coverage because it was a surprising story. You know, everyone's saying, oh, you know, you've got to restrict the number of hours you eat per day and it doubles your risk of a heart attack. Okay, so that's a great story, clickbait, front page of the Times. I put that, the press release, into Claude.ai, which is Anthropic AI's LLM, large language model. Excellent, I use it all the time in my work. And it came out with an absolutely wonderful critique. In five seconds, it critiqued that press release, tore it apart. And did the I, I'm out of a job. <laughs> I, I spent 40 years learning how to do that. And did, it did it in five seconds. And did the time... Because I read that story and I thought, I just don't believe it. Yeah. Um, uh, at the time. But did the Times print a thing saying we was had or no, anything? No, no, no. Because it's, it's not... It's just that they, they, if they put it through in the large language model, it would have told them, this isn't a very good... You can't... This is an unsubstantiated claim. So I, I, I think um, AI has got a huge potential in pulling apart claims. Thank you. Now I'm going to come to the audience now. If anybody would like to ask a question, I think you'd like microphones, wouldn't you? Um, so you were first, so you, you get first dibs, and then um, here. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, interested that no one has mentioned the regulators in, so far. Um, I mean, we have, I think, broadcast media, which are mostly heavily reg regulated. Then we have newspapers, which are slightly regulated, and, and um, social media, which is not regulated at all. But does the regulator have a bigger role or less a small role to play in any of this? David, you, you were in favour of... I, I mean, I would just say that um, television is... Um, strictly regulated, but it does not stop television. For example, exposing politicians. I've secretly filmed cabinet ministers all under the regulation. I personally really believe that um, you can have great journalism and regulation, but you were speaking in favour of the idea of regulating. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, as you've already mentioned, uh, but actually... TV regulation is not working at the moment because of GB News. It's had six complaints upheld, another 12 or something in the pipeline, yeah. and they just break it and they don't care. So, you know, what's the point of having Ofcom? So, they, they're obviously, you know, it's inadequate what goes on in journalism, in, in TV. Um, Only in GB News, which for yeah. some reason, I can't think why, yeah. has been allowed to do things sure. nobody else would be allowed to do. And I, I'm not sure you know, the regulation of, of algorithms, recommendation algorithms, which I'm, and, and, ex, and at least exposure of what they are, uh, I don't know how that, you know, I'm not a regulator, but it, it just must happen, surely. I mean, it's maybe worth mentioning the online safety bill. So there's this bit of legislation that's, that's passed here in the UK, which in theory um, mandates Ofcom, the regulator, to be able to ask the social, but what it basically does is get the social media companies to say, what are you doing to, I mean, particularly protect kids, um, but what are you doing to, to protect the users on your platform? Um, there are people who are supportive of it. Um, there are people I know who particularly whose children have been harmed by social media who are really happy and feel this marks a commitment from the government to deal with this kind of content. The other side of this is that ultimately it relies on the social media companies basically saying, we're going to do this. And then at the end of the year saying, we have done this. Um, and they, <laughs> you know, it's massively in their interests to say, we've done what you said we do. And there's this whole problem with algorithms and kind of lack of transparency that almost makes you kind of worry if they even know. <laughs> like, mm. if there, you know, how are you able to actually say, or like, this is what an algorithm's doing or not? You have to kind of be really transparent about all of your testing and the way that you've been running. I mean, there, there have been various whistleblowers, Frances Haugen being one of them who worked at Meta, um, which owns Facebook and Instagram. And she released some of the kind of data that, that they'd collected at Meta, which showed that they were kind of aware of certain types of content Absolutely. being recommended. Yeah. So that's perhaps the way this will go. Um, but it's complicated, and there's this kind of constant conversation about freedom of expression and um, whether the social media companies are publishers or yeah. not, which they don't want to be, yeah. but some people would say that they are in lots of ways. Um, and I think all of those problems are very difficult to resolve, yeah. particularly because a lot of this is about American companies um, and you know, their approach to certainly freedom of expression is actually quite different from the approach we have here and I, I kind of come across that quite a lot, which is interesting. Yeah, sadly regulation is not going to do it, I'm afraid. I mean, exactly as you say, Mariana, we, we operate in New York and London and as you say, in America it's a totally different environment. 
um, the notion of passing laws around uh, what the main platforms will be able to do in America is for the birds, I think. So it's going to have to be some form of, um, if I say voluntary agreement, it sounds ridiculous because clearly those won't be followed, but there must be some mechanisms that governments can use in Europe to ensure that there is some way of allowing audiences to discover easily verified information and news accounts. And that seems a relatively simple model that the platforms should be obliged to join. And there is, there is somewhere between passing laws and regulations, which are always going to be five years out of date. However fast the Ofcoms and the electoral commissions of this world try and operate, and the legislative um, houses try and operate, they will always be a mile behind where the market is. So somehow we've got to imagine a situation where good actors could come together, whether that's from the platforms or from our side of the debate, and support each other in amplifying the good. Briefly, David, I think you wanted to say something. Oh, I just think when, when GDPR, which started off as, a, as an EU initiative, has, has spread, has had, had you know, a big impact. So, I mean, I think, I think we should just give up just because America's, America's different. Yeah, I agree. Now, hi. Um, I wanted to go back to David's point about inoculating the public and the audience against misinformation, etc. So while I was teacher training, I came across this wonderful book called Factfulness by Hans yeah. Rosling. Yeah. So you're all nodding, so that's good. <laughs> and one of the things which I found so interesting was that there are, I think it's something like 10 reasons that he gives as to why people are so sucked into certain types of stories, like very dramatic things or, you know, terrible bits of news. They're not interested in the, in the normal because it's boring. So I was interested about your views on his reasons. One of them is this caveman attitude that we think we're hearing a story that's going to protect us in some way, and that's why we get drawn to it. And leading on from that, the school I was teaching at, they had started to teach their year eights, which were about 13 years old, about the elements within this and how, like you were saying, how you can teach children how to go about, you know, working out whether something's truthful or a lie or what sources of information they go to. So yeah. I, I just you. wanted to discuss David, that. I think okay. this is one for you, but if you've got points or questions, do put your hand up. Somebody here and somebody over there. Yeah, David. Okay, yeah, no, I feel that, that, absolutely right. I mean, that was Hans Rosling, but he was uh, an ex-master storyteller at making things that, you know, good news, reduction in, you know, in, you know, improving vaccination rates around the world, the reduction in child mortality and things like that, which doesn't get any coverage at all. He was a master storyteller at making that gripping. No point in being trustworthy if you're dull. You've got to get in there and do it. But um, the, the business of teaching kids, I made, did a Radio 4 program about this, and we went out to Silicon Valley to a high school there, you know, with the, all these kids were really, you know, really tech-savvy kids. And in their classes, they were learning about how to tear stories apart, using us ideas of horizontal searching. That in, because, and I find this reading a science, that abstract I was talking about, there's no way within that abstract I could necessarily find the problems with it, although I could. The best way to find a problem with a story is to see what other people are saying about it and the, and the provider of that information. You search horizontally, you open multiple tabs, you don't try to search just downwards to investigate, you find out what other people are saying about this, about this topic and what people are saying about the person who's producing that. And they were teaching this you know, for, to kids in this, and it seems this is great. They, the kids felt really empowered. You know, they felt, I, could, I know something that other people, my parents don't, they used to go home and tell their parents, you know, you're being taken in by this, but if you see what other people are saying about this person, you can get a right. So th these are things you can teach and learn, and it, as, as we we're saying, that it makes people feel good that they can spot when, they're, when someone's trying to take them in. And you can teach this. So I'm going to take these two points or questions together. 
Um, my question is probably more about like editorial standards in news organisations, because um, you sort of mentioned it's in, maybe it's impossible to change the minds of those on the fringes or in the extremes, but those in the middle may be more pliable. And this isn't singling out the BBC, but we have a representative from the BBC here. And if we're saying social media is a bubble, a media can maybe be a sort of a pin to prick that bubble at times. Are those standards more important? Because even semantics are quite important. So in, say, representations of the Israel-Palestine conflict that are going on, we see that Palestinian deaths are referred to as Palestinians are killed or there's deaths. But when it's Israelis, we're talking about murdering and things like that. So the question here is around, like, yeah, how do those editorial standards apply to, it's not necessarily misinformation, but it's semantics and it's engendering or empowering sort of certain groups and different people to interpret information in different ways. So what, what role is that? That's not regulatory, it's editorial standards, it's individual sort of morals as well. Thank you. We'll, we'll come to that after the... Um, there was a question over here. Yeah, just a question for um, Mariana about her experiments with the, um, the undercover accounts. So I was just wondering, um, have, have those tests always gone to plan or have you discovered kind of interesting things through them? I'm just wondering kind of, yeah, whether there was, you could shed any light on what you've learned through those things. Okay, and maybe, Mariana, you could also deal with, with the, the first question. editorial yes. standards because actually they are part of regulation. Yes, totally. Thank you both. Um, I always kind of have to start the answer to your question by saying, although I do work for the BBC, I'm not a BBC spokesperson, so I can't answer on behalf of other people's journalism. I can talk about my own. Um, uh, I think it's totally fair to point out and right that people are able to point out when the BBC th gets things wrong, when the media get things wrong. And certainly also, you know, we can't talk about social media in isolation. When we're talking about social media frenzies, for example, the media also play a part in that and have to think about it. Um, when you talk about kind of the specific use of words, like there are, um, I do know this just as somebody who works at the BBC, you know, it, in light of the war unfolding right now in Gaza and, and the attacks on the 7th of October in Israel as well, there have been really specific kind of reinforcement of the editorial guidelines around what verbs are used, are used and what words are used. Um, and certainly in my journalism, I always make sure that I do that and think about what words I'm using. Um, and I think that you're totally right that basically... It's, it's, and we've all kind of spoken about this, but and it's the trustworthy point, which is, you know, if you are um, wanting to earn the audience's trust and to keep them with you, then you absolutely have to maintain those very, very high standards. I think there's a risk, particularly in this kind of social media age, that um, some outlets can be led by kind of wanting to, like, chase where the views and likes are, but without maintaining that high standard. And it's why I really like, I mean, it's like why I like the teams I work with at the BBC, but also the news movement content, is that it's very deliberately appealing to a certain type of audience, but that doesn't mean that the standard has to be you know, any lower. It can actually be of a really high standard. So I think it's a really important point, basically, that we have to maintain those standards. Um, and that kind of links a little bit to the um, point about the undercover accounts. So when I do something like setting up those accounts, there are all kinds of really important ethical considerations about like how I run those accounts in line with our editorial guidelines and at the BBC we're trying to be even more transparent about how we do that kind of thing so um, when I set up these undercover accounts they don't have any real friends they're private they don't talk to people but they do like content that's been liked by lots of people so they don't affect other people's feeds um, they do um, uh, you know view and watch certain types of content because I want to test the algorithms and I want to often test the types of content that they are specifically recommended. So I've tended to find, um, I've used them for several panorama investigations. In some ways, I think they're the same as when a reporter goes undercover in lots of other spaces, but in this case, in the social media world. Um, I've tended to find quite shocking stuff about particularly how kids can be recommended violent and hateful content. Um, trolls are then re actively recommended kind of very extreme misogynistic content and stuff like that. Um, for Americast, which is one of the podcasts I work on at the BBC, I run the Undercover Voters uh, for them, which is five accounts that are 
to kind of sit across the political spectrum and they can't be an exhaustive look at what every US voter is seeing, um, but they do give us a kind of sense of what different people can have recommended to them. I think the most interesting thing about the undercover voters has been how quickly the apolitical voter, who basically was not interested in politics at all, did not like any of that content, didn't watch any of it, was not fussed, was very, very quickly recommended very polarising and extreme content, kind of on either side. I think that tells us so much about the active role that social media plays. It, it, it is actively, you know, often social media companies will come back and say, we're a mirror, we're reflecting all the problems in the world. And like, there are absolutely problems in the world without social media, but the way that algorithms work mean that people kind of can't take a passive stance or a more nuanced stance. And it kind of comes fundamentally also back to this point about boring. It's like exciting stuff, shocking stuff, scary stuff. It is what is recommended to us because we react to it, we engage, we like, we view it. All of us do that. Um, and I think certainly for you know, journalists in this space, you have to think about, well, how can I make my content as engaging without it being untrue or bad? And that kind of, you know, reaches into to both of what you were saying about standards. And Thank so I hope you. that answers your questions. Now, any other questions? I feel this side is letting, oh, look, one there and one there, because we've got to be equal, you know, we've got somebody from the BBC, <laughs> one side and the other side, regardless That's of whether they're true. right. That's not true. That's not true. Yes. Yeah, I'm just very interested. When about AI oh. makes creates people with six fingers, is that misinformation? I think we missed you there. Would you mind asking that again? When AI creates people with six fingers, yes. oh, is that misinformation? Question. That is a very good question. I mean, it's one of the best ways of spotting yeah. that something's been generated with AI um, because people will often have lots of fingers or lack fingers um, and all look the same. Um, so spotting that kind of stuff is a good way. Some people do actually have six fingers, I think, um, but most people don't. Um, so I think if you see something that has got six fingers, it's definitely a good way of kind of thinking, oh. And I guess it is misinformation because it's misleading in some way if it's showing something that isn't true. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about the bias against good stories, happy stories and so on. Um, I mean, do, is it true that in general there is one and perhaps that's coming from us? Is it also coming from the companies themselves? And is that going to get worse in the world that you described? And if so, what can be done to avoid just only terrible stories being promoted? Now, Kamal, do you mm. want to briefly answer this? Because yeah. the, a lot of research has been done about yeah. good stories and people not wanting to watch good stories. But you made a good point, Kamal. There's a way of not leaving an audience just feeling, oh my God, mm. I'm now hopeless and we're all doomed. So, so in social media, just two quick points. Then. In social media, the notion of what is called the onward journey, so what am I supposed to do with this information, is a very much a part of the ecology of social media storytelling. So it's not a, here's something and now the weather. It's here's something and here's something you can do with this information. So I think that's a really important point. I think we've moved on from the good versus bad, although, as you say, Mariana, algorithms uh, promote there's a tiger over let's have a discussion about something because that gets a more immediate emotional response because if there, there is a tiger, boy, you've got to do something really quickly and having a conversation around a campfire is slightly gentler but you don't have to respond quite as quickly. So the, the platforms do have a, a role here. But I think for us in the news industry, we need to make our information useful. And I think that's when people then start leaning in, oh, that was actually really useful. Either useful to help me navigate the world and my role in it and therefore how I can take opportunities for me, my family, my loved ones, my community. I think news has two has been too um, scared of seeming to be useful rather than just being informational. So I think that's where we're trying to think about it. Thank you. Now, there was one more question over at this side. Oh, right. I think we're fine. Well, oh, oh, right. The, right. They're, they're, they're winning. So th I think this will be our last question. So I hope it's good. Thank you very much. My question is about the effect of living through the pandemic 
and whether it has changed people's perception of and response to a lot of statistical information. Um, because my feeling is that throughout the pandemic, originally, initially people were very happy to take on board what they were told. And as it went on, they adjusted their responses. They found out the facts, the, where they say on social media, that suited their point of view. You've got these very opinionated shifts and anti-vaxxers and movements like that. So I was just wondering if you think the pandemic had an effect on changing the way the general public respond. <laughs> well, that's definitely one for you. Yeah, of course, I don't have any data on this. I mean, certainly, the, I'll make it up. I'll make yeah. it up. Yeah, it's right. It's yes. near For, the end. 42% of people improved their thing. Yeah. No. Did, um, did 100% of people believe you? No, definitely not. No, not, not according to the abuse I got. Not as much as you got. Oh, I only got a fraction. But I, I, yeah. but I did get some. So, um, no, I... I it, as you said, there was a lot of statistics about, and there was a lot of interest in them, and it really, I mean, there was some fantastic data journalism, a you know, huge amount of interest on social media, some fantastic work being done by people and being spread around. There was, you know, as you said, it was polarised, it was polarised pretty early on between these different, different groups of people. Some of us were trying to sort of sit in the middle. And, um, and I, I, what is left in this sort of entrails afterwards is... Um, Yes, there's some very disillusioned people who have made up their minds, they've done their own research, and they follow some appalling grifters on YouTube and things like that who are making stonks of money from their Patreon accounts by churning out, endlessly churning out, um, you know, controversial stuff based on you know, mis misuse of, of numbers. So it's there. How big that is, even if these people have got 3 million followers on YouTube, you know, they're... they're um, how important that is, I don't know, but it, it's, I don't even know how many people are actually, they're, they're noisy because I follow them on, on Twitter, X. I, you know, I deliberately follow people I don't agree with because I want to know what they're saying. So for me, I see a lot of this stuff, but I don't quite know how big it is. Um, but yeah, no, I think that, and I think the government you know, has a lot of blame about that. I think they were uh, quite a lot of bad communication of numbers, I called it number theatre, just spouting out big numbers. And, of course, it breeds, a, among some people, a real cynicism about the claims that are being made. And I think that's very unfortunate. But there are also some very trusted communicators who did very well. I think you know, there's some fantastic work being done, that was done. So it, it, what it did really was raise the profile of numbers and turn them into, I think, more of a battleground than they had been in the past. And for me, you know, that's, you know, in a way that's... You know, all bread and butter, but um, it, I, and I think it did reveal the, the real importance of these, and that this is, you know, as we go on, uh, there's going to be a lot of numbers in this election that come up. Um, so I, uh, I'm pleased, in a way, that numbers got a higher profile because actually they are; they're describing what goes on in the world. And uh, but it's they they have to be. You also need an informed and as I said, sceptical but not cynical, public. And that, and kids who can learn to identify six fingers on a, be suspicious of six fingers on a uh, photograph. Can I just say, Don, just want to leave us on one slightly more hopeful data point. I was editorial director during the pandemic at BBC News. The most popular pages that BBC News has ever published in its history were what are the COVID rules in my area and what is the level of infection in my area, which both got over a billion views. So the public came to the BBC multiple times in their millions to get trusted information and trust actually went up yeah. in yeah. journalism because people needed rigour and yeah. facts because it was about their lives. And I think that was actually a very good moment to say why trusted, factual, engaging journalism really matters. Well, thank you very much. So, first of all, I have to say that over there was the winning question. So, can we congratulate this... Um, uh, oh, well, if anybody knows them, you'll have to tell them. So, I think you will agree with me that they said that they had to be not boring, you were not boring, you had to earn our trust. Well, I already trusted you a lot. But um, I think you did earn our trust. 
and and you uh, and we have to go on an onward journey and it's the onward journey that we will you've given us lots of ideas about how to spot misinformation disinformation lies and conspiracy theories so thank you very much thank you